Well, good morning, everyone. We are Anne Rotzenet and Christian Günther from Flexicons, and we are going to talk about process mining. Now, process mining is about discovering maps from data, and I will show you what that means in a minute. Um, um, before that, I want to start with an example of data analytics of 150 years ago. It's at the time of the big maritime fleet, um, so all the trade is going on through the sea, and there's huge customer demand for all kinds of goods and spices and so on. To meet this demand, however, there's only incremental improvement possibilities. So basically the ships are running with 24-hour sails, um, yeah, the crew doesn't get any, any breaks, and so on and so forth. Um, until Matthew Maury came, so he was the first who actually did a systematic analysis of the logbook data that was stored in the US Naval Observatory. They were even thinking about throwing those logbooks away. Um, but he discovered them and he found that they have very valuable information about different positions and winds and currents. And what he did is that he looked at those logbooks for a couple of different trips over a period of years uh, with a small team. And based on that information, he created maps, which he called sailing directions, um, which contained information about the winds and the currents and uh, could be used to find the ideal route for a trip. And one of the first um, people who used that was Captain Wright, uh, who on a trip from Baltimore to Rio de Janeiro returned one month earlier than planned. Now, over the time, already I think five years after the release of those sailing directions, it was saving the global tr yeah, um, trading economy about, around $10 million per year. So that's an awful lot of money if you think how much would that be today. Well, there's a lot of similarities to this story and process mining because at process mining, we also look at log data, um, but these log data are created um, through IT systems from business processes that are operating. And with process mining, we analyze these log data. However, instead of looking at log books from ships, of course, we are looking at digital traces. So um, transaction data extracted from IT systems. And instead of yeah, wind and current maps, of course, we are discovering um, process maps which show us exactly how these processes have been performed. Now, why do we need this? Um, so here is a typical problem that I see also when I go to see clients. Well, if they talk about the ideal process or the documented process, it's typically very simple, very structured. First we do this, then we do that. Um, however, the process reality is much more complicated. There's a lot of more variation, there's rework, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so if there's such a big gap between the documented and the real process, you can ask yourself, what's the use of a model process in the first place? And well, here's an example of one um, customer who put this process map that they had, that was their documented process on the table uh, while discussing a problem that he had with his process, and he said, well, but that's not actually how we work. So people are aware of this kind of gap between the documented and the real process. So these process documentation processes are good for documenting, for communicating, maybe instructing new people, but they're completely useless to um, solve problems in the process uh, and to manage um, the process. And actually, if we look at this gap here, again, this gap isn't even the main problem. The biggest problem is actually that companies usually don't have a clue how their real process looks like. So, in a way, what do you do then? You are basically limited to making decisions based on your experience, based on intuition and gut feeling, without any objective information to decide. So, in a way, we are like the sailors before Maori came along with his sailing directions. And, um, of course, if you work in a process for such a long time, you can be right with your intuition, and sometimes people just know what is wrong, but maybe they can't prove it, and there are other people who don't believe them, and they can't put their finger on it, so that's one situation, but also we have seen many examples where you can be completely off, because as we all know, our memory is unreliable, and um, yeah, we all have very subjective views about what we are experiencing around us. So. 
what, to what this leads to sometimes is really even deadlock situations in an organization where people argue based on opinions and as a result nothing happens at all, nothing gets done. So I've seen this more than once too. Well, so process mining exactly tries to fill this void by discovering the real process as it has been performed and we are going to show that to you now in a live demo. We're going to start with the data set that we're, to show you the data set that we're using for the demo. So as you can see, every row, every line here corresponds to one event or one activity that took place. And there are three minimum requirements to be able to do process mining. And I can explain them here to you based on that um, example. Uh, first of all, we need a case ID or a process instance identifier. So that is necessary to correlate the events or activities that belong to the same case. So for example, here we look at yeah, a whole number of events, all related to the purchase order number 940. The second requirement that we have towards the data is that there needs to be a process step or an activity name for each of these events. So which step in the process was performed. And the third requirement is that we need at least one timestamp. And that's necessary to bring these events uh, in the right order. Of course, also to, to measure time delays between them, but also to reconstruct the process flow. So the case ID, the activity name, and the timestamp are the minimum requirements that we have, but there's a lot of additional information that you can have in, in extra columns. Here we have information about the resource, the role um, in the organization, and there can be a whole, yeah, a lot of additional information that can be used for the analysis, but it's not mandatory. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to the, to the process mining part. We're using this data um, to discover the process. And to do that, we first import the data. And that's the same file that we just looked at in Excel. Now, as a first step, we have to create a mapping to these three minimum requirements. The first one is the case ID. Um, we have to tell what's the activity name and what's the timestamp. So we create the mapping here uh, by configuring the data. And then um, we can import the data, but before we do that, just keep in mind, if you want to get a picture of the SS process, usually you start with a workshop from a blank sheet of paper, um, so it's a lot of work, and at the end, you, you don't even know whether that's really the true process that you're getting. Here we start with the transactional data from the IT systems, and when, with the click of a button, uh, we automatically reconstruct the process as it has been really performed. So we're zooming in, in here, and let me explain to you how you can read this process map. So the process starts at the top here with the little triangle, and 608 purchase orders, in this case, are in the data set. Now, all of them start with create purchase order requisition. That's the first activity in the process, and afterwards, it splits into two alternative paths. So 374 go to analyze purchase requisition as the second activity, and 234 are going the other way. Now, based on the numbers, the thickness of the arcs and the coloring, um, we can see the frequency, um, so the most frequent process flows are visualized here in this process map. And from a process improvement perspective, we can already see one very interesting thing. So there's a very dominant uh, rework loop here where purchase orders are being amended, so they're changed. That's not even a process activity that's supposed to be there in the normal process. And it happens an awful uh, lot of times. So um, out of 608 cases, more than 500 times we're going through this loop here. So I would want to find out now what's the root cause for that and how I can prevent that in the future. Okay, so we have seen from the raw transactional data, we can get automatically to this process map showing us how the process looks like um, in an objective way. And one thing that we have is that real processes can become very complex, so we need means to interactively simplify them. We show that to you um, here by first pulling the activity slider to the very bottom. So in this case, we only show the activities from the most frequent variant in the process. So that's really the main flow of the process. And then by gradually pulling up the activity slider, um, we can yeah, piece by piece reveal also less frequent activities until at 100% we see all the activities that were uh, performed, like this one here. The amend purchase requisition um, it just occurred 11 times. Well, what you also see is that there are actually 11 cases coming in at amend purchase requisition, but only eight are, are going out. 
spec to analyze purchase requisition, so you may wonder where are the other three. Well, that's because we don't see all the paths yet. So we can, once we pull up the path slider to 100%, we now see 100% of all the process um, flows, and in this case, we can see those three that were going here to create requests for quotation. Okay, so this um, demonstrates how from the raw data we get to um, the objective process map. And now let's look at another scenario where we are looking at actually metrics. Um, so we were looking at the statistics to, yeah, to get further information about our process to see how it's doing. On the right, we see some overview information like the number of events um, and cases. So we see there are 608 cases, 9,000 events. Um, it's a very small data set. With process mining in Disco, we can analyze data sets of many millions of events. Um, we see the time frame, for example. The log is running from January till October 2011. And let's just look at one example, the case duration. So that's the time from the very beginning to the end of the process. And we see that most cases are finished within 16 or 17 days. However, there are some that are really taking very long, like more than 70 or 80 days even. So now, again, from a process improvement perspective, we would like to understand what's going on here and where in the process are we actually losing so much time. So to do that, we can um, use um, a fil edit filter. So we use a performance filter here to focus only on the very slow cases, the ones who take, let's say, 70 days um, and more. And we can see already that's covering around 15% of our data set. Um, now, once we add this filter, we focus only on the slow cases, and we can see that here uh, we are now not looking at the full, but only the this, this subset of the data, and once we go back to the map, uh, we now also see the process map just for those 92 very slow running cases, and we see that this loop here, this rework loop, is even more dominant than before. On average, I go three times through this loop. Um, compared to before, um, but actually I'm not so much interested in the frequency here, but in the time in the performance dimension. So switching there, I now see the delays, and the total duration gives me the, uh, the cumulative delays over all uh, the data in the, in, the, in the file, and that's quite useful to spot high impact areas, uh, because the frequency also plays a role in uh, what the impact of a, of a change is, for example. But let's go to the average duration to see how long it takes on average um, to execute and to get to an activity. And here we see quite clearly a very big bottleneck. So not even am I going through this additional rework loop here that shouldn't be there in the first place, but it takes me more than 14 days to get back to the normal process. And actually this activity is quite a bottleneck also from other parts of the process. So huge delays are caused by it. Now once we have discovered this bottleneck, we want to communicate it and share it with the stakeholders to find root, yeah, possible solutions for that. And to do that, we can use the animation. So anim animation is a great way um, to communicate the bottlenecks and, and process behavior that we have found. And what we are doing is we are replaying the data from, from the log. So it's not a simulation, but really an animation, a replay. Every yellow dot is one case moving through the process based on the timestamp. And once we move yeah, let's fo fast forward a little bit. So if we do that, we see that over time, really this bottleneck here emerges and uh, we can see where in the process work piles up. And it's a very tangible way to communicate and discuss this with the stakeholders. You don't need to be a process modeling expert or anything like that. Okay, let's go back and I want to show you two more things just to illustrate the spectrum of, of process mining uh, techniques. Um, so we are going back to the full data set, the one uh, with all the cases, not just the slow running ones. Um, we are looking at the end of the process there. So once the part where actually the invoice is created and eventually paid. And what you can see is that based on these thick um, arcs, so there's a very frequent path which is followed by most of the cases. Um, and actually there's one activity release suppliers invoice which is mandatory, so for fraud, prevention reasons that always has to be performed. However, you can see that there are 10 cases that are actually sneaking um, well by this activity, so they are bypassing it. And well, that's a compliance issue because our, our uh, procedure requires that we do this. So we have found out that this problem exists, but now as a next step, we want to find out which 10 cases are actually 
moving that path. So we can click on this arc to say, filter this path, which means give me all cases that travel by this particular path. And once we do that, um, we add another filter, which is in this case uh, pre-configured. We could also add it manually, but we in this case only have to apply the filter to get to a, a, a data set only focusing on those 10 cases. And here we see the process map, but actually we are much more interested in this case in the cases, which is now the third uh, view here where we are really on the level of individual cases and we can see the detailed history for each of them. We can look at the purchase order number here in the original system to verify that this um, yeah, compliance issue really took place. And we can also speak to the people, give them targeted training uh, to get to the bottom of this. Okay, so now to finish um, the demo, we would like to show you um, how you can take different views on the same data. And for that, we are going back to the import screen where we are or mapping the cases and activity columns. So let's say we have understood the activity flow very well and now we want to understand the organizational flow and to want to look at how actually the process flows through the different functions and roles in the organization. So we're simply configuring the role here as the activity and we import the data again. And what we see here is that we get based on the same data set an alternative view on the data. Um, now from an organizational perspective and we can also look at the performance view. Um, so we see inefficiencies that emerge um, in the handover of work between uh, functional units. So I hope this demonstrates how um, with process mining you can take transactional data that is there in the IT systems and you can use it to very quickly um, understand and drill down into this data from a process perspective, understand how the process works and ask process-related questions about it.